Welcome to Community Matters. I'm Trisha Heiss. On May the 28th of 2015 marked the one year anniversary of the flash bang explosion that rocked our community and exploded in the face of Baby Boo Boo. Commonly and affectionately known as Baby Boo Boo, our community as well as his family made national headlines as a result of a no-knock warrant and a flashbang that was used that exploded in his face. On June the 14th of 2014, our community was invaded by protesters and supporters alike. Protesters against law enforcement, against flash grenades, against stun grenades, and against no-knock warrants. On the other side, supporters of law enforcement, those wanting drugs in our community to stop. And so today, we interview Mr. Eric Welburn, the foreperson of the grand jury who heard all of the testimony, all of the evidence, got to feel, see, and otherwise experience flash grenades in person. We will hear from him today and the reasons why the grand jury decided to return a no bill. That means no charges brought against any law enforcement personnel involved in this case. In addition to the criminal side, we have information concerning the settlement of the case on the civil side. Over $900,000 has been awarded to the family of Baby Boo Boo due to medical expenses and personal injuries and emotional distress. Welcome to Community Matters as we interview Mr. Eric Welburn. Thank you, Eric, for being here today. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and, and thank you for joining us with Community Matters. Um, one of the things that I feel is so important about sitting down and talking with you is the fact that both you and I are from this area. We grew up here. Went to school together. We went to school together. We've known each other literally our entire lives. And sitting down and talking to you and talking about the evidence that you heard and the final conclusion that was reached, um, I feel like was is vitally important, especially to discuss with our viewers. Um, first of all, tell us how it was serving on the grand jury and hearing the evidence and the testimony that was presented. It was tough. I mean, you know, it's um, emotional. You know, you talk about uh, one, a baby, and then two, people that, you know, live in your community that you've also known for many, many years. and. Um, we knew and understood how important it was and I think with our um, presentation we wanted to show how much uh, we took took it into heart this the whole case and uh, you know we are the only group who saw all the evidence and there's you know lots of things that we still can't discuss um, but we feel and felt as a group that we did exactly the right thing and um, Maybe that 15 or 16 page presentment was a little bit long, but we wanted to make sure we got it all out there. Well, ultimately the grand jury, you as the four person, wrote a document in which you found that there was not sufficient evidence to move forward with criminal charges against any law enforcement personnel as it relates to the May 28, 2014 incident. No, no, not with the laws we were given. There's no way we can find anybody guilty. How long, or send them to court. okay, how long were, was the evidence presented to you? How long did you as the four person of the grand jury and the grand jury members report to the Habersham County Courthouse? Oh, uh, when you serve on the grand jury, it's a six month stint. And uh, we not only did that case, we also did the indictments during that period of time. So, but that specific case was, um, I think it was almost two weeks. I mean, we, we were in the room listening to nothing but evidence from eight in the morning or nine in the morning until five every day for, for seven days straight, um, Monday through Friday, then came back the following Monday. But we were able to look at it over the weekend, the, evidence, the information we had. What type <laughs> of evidence was presented that you were able to either see, hear, touch? Uh, we got to view a, a live demonstration of a, a flashbang grenade. Where did um, that take place? 
uh, over behind uh, Robertson Loop Road, the city of Clarksville has a firing range out there, and it's it's pretty remote. So, so the grand jury, in, a, um, in essence, took a field trip out to. Yeah, we all drove out there, and it was very very hot, if I remember it correct, and uh, we watched a flashbang. Okay. Well, let me let's talk about the fact that you keep referring to it as a flashbang. Um, I even brought a newspaper article that was published by the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And this was published in April of 2015, actually April the 22nd of 2015, in which in this article, the Atlanta Journal and Constitution continues to refer to it as a stun grenade explosion. Stun grenade, I mean, they need to do their homework a little better, I guess. Okay, well that's why we're here. It's completely different, a stun <laughs> grenade and a flashbang. I guess it can stun you, but it's, uh, it's technically a flash bang grenade. Okay. My point being this, living here, growing up here, knowing what we know, you having served as a member of the grand jury, actually as a foreperson of the grand jury, does it bother you at all that outside media, big city media, national media continue to get the information incorrect? Well, absolutely. I mean, who wouldn't it? it uh, you know, they want to glorify it and make it sensationalize it, make it worse than what it is. I mean, it, did a child get hurt? Yes, it, a child did, but nobody wanted it. It was a complete accident. Nobody meant for that to happen. But if you're going to talk about it, you need to get everything out there that you can. And I, I assume that we're, like I said, we're the only group that heard everything. And our decision is what it was because we heard everything. And ultimately, what was the recommendation by the grand jury? Um, nobody would be charged with anything. Okay. We, we couldn't find any charges against any law enforcement officer. Did, did the grand jury have any type of recommendations to law enforcement? Nothing. I mean, we had a list of what we ultimately could charge somebody with, uh, the different laws, you know. I mean, we're, we're not a law enforcement ourselves. We don't, we're not attorneys. So we had a list of what possibly could be something, and we had to weigh what the the choices were and, and nothing even came close. Were there any type of recommendations by the grand jury as it related to training or any type of um, designated um, drug, to drug task force or um, the implementation of maybe a regional task force? We made, yes we did, we made some recommendations in our presentment. Um, we wanted some, to make sure that Everybody had their training and uh, continuing aid. Um, I don't remember exactly what everything's in the presentment, but I know that uh, we wanted it read at the assembly, you know, for the, the state representatives and for them to hear what we dealt with and to try to prevent this from happening again in the future. You know, not just for the baby who was the only innocent one in all this, but um, for law enforcement, you know, those guys. They didn't want any of this to happen. Did you speak directly to the members who were involved? We spoke directly with a few, not many, I thought one or two. I know um, we heard live testimony or recorded testimony, not live, but um, we didn't have to personally interview all of them. There was no need to. If you could explain to our viewers what the emotional reaction was from these law enforcement officers. Um, you know, it was, they were tore up. They're all decent guys, you know. You gotta understand, it, it put yourself in their shoes, you're doing a job. And, you know, they're not bad people. They're everyday people that, you know, we know. And um, I tried to put myself in their shoes. What if I was part of this accident? and it happened and, and you wish you could change it and there's nothing you can do except you know go day to day and try to make up for it. Now you're aware that the um, family members of the child that was injured in this um, um, flashbang incident that occurred on May the 28th of 2015, um, the Fonsavon family did sue um, are you aware that it appears that that case perhaps has settled? Yeah, I've seen some of it on online and on the news, so okay. I, I can keep up with it. Okay, do you care to give us your personal opinion about that? Um, I'm glad it's wrapping up. I think, um, I think the baby, you know, uh, he needs to be taken care of. I 
personally think the responsibility falls <clears throat> amongst everybody involved. I think it could have been prevented beforehand, myself. Um, I'm just glad we're putting it behind us. I hope it never happens again. Your position, your opinion as it related to what should happen to the law enforcement officers who were involved in this flashbang device that went off at the home of um, that was shared by the Fonsevong family. And I believe I recall you, we've either had some type of an engagement, maybe at the grocery store, or perhaps I read something on Facebook about how you initially felt. Yeah, my, my initial thought of this ordeal, um, I wasn't happy with it. I was upset that a child got hurt, and understandably, just like so many other people were. Um, you know, I, I felt, how did we not know there were children in this house? And the ultimate responsibility lies on law enforcement. I, I'm prior law enforcement military. I was MP for eight years. So to me, you know, gathering intelligence is the number one key to what you're, if you're, you're carrying out a, a op. And in my opinion, you know, I, I felt, how did we not know there was kids in the house? And that was a big kicker for so many people. You know, it, um, but when you think about it, there was more to the story. Their law enforcement wasn't the only ones responsible for all this. So, you know, when you look at all the evidence and everything that was happening and the big picture, you know. There's more to the story. There's more to the story. And, and I personally felt after hearing all the testimony and all the evidence that mom and dad, um, Alicia and Buncom, were partly responsible for this situation, you know. I mean, they, they knew what was going on. Uh, mom admitted on national television. national television under recordings. I mean, she swore to that she was aware there was... What exactly do you recall her saying or indicating? What, uh, indicating that she knew that Juan Estanatheva, the perpetrator in, in this whole case, uh, was a drug dealer and that there was some drug sales being happening at this house. And the, the day that the drug deal happened, Booncom was actually present within, you know, so many feet of the drug deal. I mean, they were, I wouldn't say he was 50 feet away, but probably less than that. Uh, I, I didn't pull out yardsticks and measure. But to not be aware of it and what we heard uh, would just be absurd. You can imagine, and, and I could too, that it would be a very sympathetic story to tell people about um, losing their house to a fire in a different state, having to relocate and come and live with family. It is a sympathetic story, and, and I've met Alicia before. You know, she worked at the Waffle House in Cornelia for, for a few weeks, and I talked to her there. I saw her kids. I saw her husband. I mean, she's very happy. I, I liked her, but at the same time, you know, every, the, the saying goes, when you lay with snakes, or you play with snakes, you're going to get bit. And, and to me, if you know that there's drugs anywhere near your children, you just can't stay. I mean, you, you can't put them in that position. I mean, if, if it would have been a drug deal gone bad and kids would have got shot, there wouldn't have been all this media attention. But since it was law enforcement that it happened to, you know, that everybody's talking about it because of an accident that happened. Was there anything during the grand jury presentment, was there one thing that changed your mind or was it a culmination of everything? It was a little bit of everything. I mean, uh, do I think law enforcement was, they were hurried, like we said, hurried and sloppy and they didn't gather the right intelligence and that was, that falls on their shoulders. But the bottom line is no drugs being sold from this house. And everybody says he didn't even live there. Well, if you were gonna mail Juan Estanatheva a letter, I think you'd have sent it to that house. I mean, I don't know where else he lived if he didn't live there. That's his mama's house. He stayed there. His son lived there. There was, I don't know how much he stayed there, but I don't think he had a certain set residence. But he was there that day because he sold drugs out of that house that day. And that wasn't the first, the, the next biggest thing was about using no knock and a flashbang. They had every right, in my opinion, to use that no knock warrant. One, because that's not the first time law enforcement's been called to that house. There were several other incidents that law enforcement needed to go there. And there's been 
weapons involved. I mean, they had every right to go in full bore and being afraid of their, you know, for their lives. So how can you expect them? Was it a, do we know how much drugs he had on him? No, you have no idea. But I don't think this community needs any more drugs being sold like that. Mr. Thonathava. Thonathava. Correct. Juanus Thonathava was not present when the flashbang mm -hmm. um, was, was utilized and the no-knock warrant was, was implemented. He was actually located at a different residence. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, in addition to that, were there any drugs found in the house at that time that the uh, flashbang no-knock warrant was implemented? I don't think there was drugs found, but I think there was some um, paraphernalia. Uh, I think once the child got hurt that everything kind of switched to a different mode. Um, I, I don't know how good a, a search went through, but the bottom line was there was drugs sold at that house, and that wasn't the first time there had been drugs sold at the house. You know, do, do I think it's a drug house? I, I don't know. That wasn't for me to decide. Well, I mean, how but do you just, define a drug house? Yeah, I mean, but the bottom line is, yes, drugs were sold there. We know drugs were sold there. And since that time, Mr. Um, Thonathava has been sentenced. Sentenced Correct. and apparently has gotten out and got arrested again. Okay. Well, let's talk about that because that was um, when you and I first started talking about doing this on-camera interview. Mm -hmm. That was one of the first things that you mentioned to me was that Mr. Thonathava had had in fact been arrested again for drugs again. Correct. Um, and I know that you have developed a great working relationship with the district attorney's office having served as a foreperson of the grand jury. Did you have an opportunity to talk to anyone from the DA's office about Mr. Thonathava's sentence as it relates to the drug charges that were from May the 28th of 2014? Yes, yes. And from my understanding, you know, Mr. Thonathava pled guilty, took his sentence, and I think he was banned from the circuit and shouldn't even be in the area. Should not even be in the area. From my understanding, he's not supposed to be in Habersham County. And yet, our own now Habersham has reported that on, um, the, the report came out on April the 18th of 2015, that Mr. Juanis Thonathava was in fact arrested again. In Demarest. In Demarest, Georgia, at the house of 300 Church Chuck Wagon Drive in Demarest. It appears that the drug bust happened in which um, a half an ounce of methamphetamine, oxycodone, um, Dilaudid and marijuana were seized from this residence. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised? No. Disappointed, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I, I try not to dwell on it too much, but I think it kind of puts everything in perspective a little better of, of who law enforcement was dealing with. Do you, think, um, do you think it's interesting that national media coverage hasn't picked up on that particular story? I think they're going to sensationalize what feels good to them. Uh, to be honest, I really don't care about national media. I mean, I like my town. I think uh, law enforcement we have here are good guys. Um, the GBI, Ben Couch, that put all this together, that did all the interviews and gathered the evidence. And, you know, I think he did an outstanding job. Um, Brian Rickman, Eddie Staples, uh, the whole district attorney's office, and the law enforcement, the, the SRT team, you know, they train hard and they're high speed and you know they do the best they can and you know people make mistakes and it, and it happens but I don't think that they're wholly responsible for any of this. Um, the Sheriff's Office, Joey Terrell, you know, I, Joey you can tell we're lucky to have him as a sheriff uh, in my opinion. I mean, he's a great guy, he cares more so than any other sheriff I've seen and that's who I'd want to keep as sheriff or, or have as a sheriff, somebody who cared. And, um, I don't know, I think we made the right decision and the presentment and everything that we put our heart and souls into everything. We took it personal. I mean, it was uh, six months of my life on the grand jury and so much of it was about this case and I lived it, ate it, breathed it for weeks, if not months. And um, you know, it, it, I didn't, I lost sleep at night thinking about this case. and trying to make the right decision. And it wasn't easy to deal with. It was one of the toughest things I've ever dealt with. Absolutely. But um, we made the right decision. You know, we looked at everything. And uh, what we came up with, our presentment, is 
I stand by it. And I think if you put 23 or 24 new people in a room, give them the same evidence, they'll come out with the same. The same outcome. Same outcome. As far as I know, I'm the only person that you've ever granted an interview to. Yes, ma'am. Twice. Twice this now. Is two times, this and is I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> this is it. This is it. Um, I, I completely feel that um, people needed to hear somebody's side of the story that heard everything. Um, you know, media has portrayed this so horribly against the law enforcement officers, and, and I'm not trying to glorify them, but you got to hold everybody accountable. I think society nowadays has a real bad issue of not, um, everybody not being accountable for their own actions. And I completely think that more, to, more than law enforcement was to blame, I, you know, they're not the bad guys in this. One of the things that the grand jury uh, recommended in their presentation was additional training and maybe perhaps looking at um, a restructuring of the of the drug task force and mm -hmm. some of those things have happened yes we, there's the new regional drug task force uh, the drug task force that we had before is, is disbanded um, I don't think anybody who was involved with it's involved with the new one uh, it is headed by the GBI and uh, there's a lot more checks and balances and I think that's a good thing um, and anytime we can give them better more training uh, is a good thing that anything that helps them um, do their job to the best of their ability is, is good to me. And you know, one of the good things as being a grand jury, we get to make a, um, you know, I guess we get to view things and give our ideas of what could be improved. And uh, we definitely want to give law enforcement more money to make themselves better, you know, to, to have sensitivity training, to be able to interact with the community and, and uh, one other thing to pr not have incidents like this happen again. You know, we, um, we don't need bad publicity and nobody wants it. Our guys are, they don't deserve it and uh, this county doesn't deserve it. I, I've done a lot of traveling in my life, you know, I'm still 37 years young, but I always love coming home. You know, this is, um, center of my world here. It's a great place to live. It is. I yeah. tell people all the time, I can live anywhere I want to live. I choose to live here. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can't live anywhere I want to live. But <laughs> yes, you can I if love, you wanted to. I love living here. This yes. is um, the, this county, This is all the cities involved. It, it's a wonderful place. It is a wonderful place. And, uh, well, what are some of the um, the new tra task force that has taken the, the regional, the area, um, the ARD, ha is actually the... Um, the task force that was involved in arresting Juanis mm -hmm. um, thought of Theva. You know they were probably surprised when they saw him there. Are you being facetious? Uh, a little. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I see uh, Agent Posey's name, Mitchell Posey, mm -hmm. who's in charge of the drug task force, who's an agent of the GBI. Mm -hmm. I see his name pop up too, too often, yeah. too often for our area yeah. for certain. So. Do you have any parting words or anything else that you would like to add? No, I just, um, I appreciate being able to do what we did. I don't want to ever want to do it again. Um, it was tough. It was hard dealing with. Uh, I appreciate everybody involved, all the law enforcement, um, the district attorney's office, and, um, you know, the family. I, I hate it for the family. I hate it for baby boo-boo. Like I said, he's the, the innocent one in all this. You know, he's the, the child who was injured and unfortunately so many things aligned for this to happen and um, maybe we won't ever have to deal with it again. Okay. That's my hope. Thank you to Mr. Eric Welburn who served as the foreperson of the grand jury, hearing and seeing and witnessing the testimony presented by the district attorney's office, the sheriff's department and the GBI in returning a no bill of any type of criminal charges against our law enforcement. This is our community and I, as well as our staff with Community Matters, are very proud to present our community with local Community Matters. Thank you once again.